Welcome to Across the Dietary Universe, a podcast where we bring experts along our voyage to discover the secrets of food and how it relates to each of our unique dietary profiles. From the origins of diets to current eating trends to the frontier of food innovation and the future of how we eat, we'll discover that when it comes to food, things are not necessarily as they seem. Honeycomb is a mobile app that works with your iPhone or Android device to help you find suitable food to eat at restaurants near you based on your specific dietary requirements. If you're plant-based and celiac, low FODMAP with a tree nut allergy, keto and dairy-free, we support countless dietary combinations and profiles. Based on your inputs, Honeycomb curates the best restaurants for you and the best options to order at those restaurants. If you have more severe allergies, don't worry. Honeycomb only recommends you places that have a clear protocol to deal with cross-contamination. Pre-order Honeycomb today at get.honeycomb.ai. Okay, okay, okay. Well, uh, I want to introduce today Amanda Orlando to the podcast. Amanda, it's so nice to have you with us. Thanks so much for being here and taking the time out of your day to speak with us about a very important topic that we'll get into very shortly. Thank you for inviting me on the show. So just to give everyone uh, and our listeners uh, an introduction, Amanda Orlando is a writer, recipe developer, and thought leader within the food allergy community. She has a holistic approach to managing food allergies and helps her readers overcome fears and anxiety that come along with an allergy diagnosis. She's published two cookbooks with recipes that can help people be creative with what they can eat rather than what they can't. And I have a list here of all the things that you're allergic to and your experiences of having autoimmune disease since birth. Uh, And all that is meant to say is the ethos, meaning that you know what the heck you're talking about. (laughs) Yeah, I hope so. (laughs) Well, uh, and and, and just the, uh, you know, the topic for the podcast today, because it's a little bit different than what we typically do. uh, but, But the main theme here is this question. Is it discriminatory for restaurants to ban food allergy patrons? And why are they doing it? And we came across your article, which is how we sort of happened to come into this podcast. But um, I don't know. You tell me how you'd like to start this and how this, uh, you know, this obviously uh, rubbed you the wrong way when you saw that. But from what I read in the article, you took sort of a devil's advocate approach, which is rare these days. Yes. Devil's advocate doesn't exist anymore. (laughs) No, one thing that I never want to do with my writing is that I never produce an article just for clickbait. I'm never going to take a firm stance on something without presenting all of the information. And I think that's something that people found unique about the blog post because I did look at it from both sides. And I try to always do that with every issue that I write about um, because my personality is such that I just like to know all of the information and make an educated decision. And that's just how I approach everything with food allergies i would Uh rather know and i would rather look at it from all sides and then pick my point of view right and it seems that not only do you do that in terms of your writing you also do that in terms of how you actually go about dining out and from my from my experience with people with with food allergies there's like maybe three camps maybe you have more insight on this but one camp would be yolo let's take the EpiPen and have a few of them and let's do whatever and take our chances. The other camp would be you, which I think you've defined as a calculated risk. Um, And then the third camp would be any risk is too much risk. Um, Is that somewhat accurate? Mm -hmm. I would say that's a very accurate summary. There, (laughs) There really do seem to be these three camps. And I will say that I've been part of all of them at some point, which is how I've arrived where I am today. Uh-huh. And I think where I am today is definitely the most comfortable place. When I was younger, especially when I was a teenager, I did a lot of really risky things that in hindsight, I was very lucky that nothing happened. And actually, I shouldn't say nothing happened. I did have reactions and I did have a lot of scares. And that's how I learned that like the YOLO approach is really not the best way to go through life um, because it doesn't always work out. A lot of times you get lucky and sometimes you don't. Um, And then I've also gone the other direction where I was so overcautious that I couldn't enjoy eating in a restaurant. And that was just such a horrible feeling. Like I never want to go back to that. So now I'm in this 
it's a nice cozy middle zone where like I pick my restaurants carefully and I really enjoy them when I'm there. Right. That's so great that, that you were able to, you know, you, you, you sort of experienced those other two camps and you, you, you found a happy place. You found the Goldilocks zone. And, but do, do you recommend uh, people to be in that zone or basically just do whatever makes you happy? I, I try to tell people that really if it's hard because I don't, I don't really like to recommend anyone's way of living. I right. guess that's something I should say up front. You know, it's like people's comfort level with having allergens in their home. Right. I have a certain comfort level that I I'm, I'm aware that it makes other people uncomfortable. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So I try not to preach about how I think anyone should live right. um, because I wouldn't like it if someone was doing that to me. But I will say that there is op- there should be some optimism. Like there are people out there who want to cater to you and who want to give you a good restaurant experience. And it's mm. really just a matter of finding those people. Before we get into before we get into the restaurant experience and get into more, you know, uh, along the lines of the theme and the topic of the article and so on. Can you tell me a little bit about your experience growing up with because it says you have an autoimmune disease from birth, but then uh, my understanding is that you also got diagnosed with other food allergies later on. Yeah. Oh, I don't want to nitpick, but it should just be immune disease. <laughs> Sorry if that was a mistake on my website, I'll correct it. But um, oh, yeah, I've had immune, immune disease, disease. So yeah, multiple anaphylactic allergies since birth. And the list has changed over the years. And that's one of the unpredictable things of food allergies is that you're born with maybe a set of allergens, you develop a set of allergens, it doesn't mean that those are going to be the ones you have for the rest of your life. So I actually outgrew some allergies. And then I grew into other ones. And it kind of was like an evolving process. So I wouldn't say I have more allergies now as an adult, I just have different ones. So when you were when you were younger, you had some allergies that you don't have now. Yeah, when I was younger, I was allergic to eggs, chicken, some fruits, um, a whole bunch of things that I outgrew. Pardon? Were these severe allergies or were they more? Yeah, these were anaphylactic allergies and I had to do oral challenges at the allergist office for all of them. So I outgrew all of those allergies by around the age of seven. Um, But then the rest of my allergies hung around. So (laughs) um, I've also, yeah, I have dairy, anaphylactic dairy allergy, nut, peanut, soy, um, and the soy one got significantly worse as I got older. So yeah, I've had a to use my EpiPen lots of times, um, right. but you know, so when you we're go, fortunate that we have them. Yeah, m- definitely. And I, yeah, I mean, that's, that's rough to hear that, you know, anytime it's used as a scary situation, mm-hmm. um, in your, in, in recent times, I imagine given the new approach, you probably haven't had to use it as much. I, yeah, I haven't had to use it in a few years. Um, knock on wood, there's yeah. no wood around yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I have yeah, some bamboo have here. Had- <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had to use it in probably I want to say like six years it's been a while um when I was younger I used it more right yeah. when you were taking a little bit more more chances and stuff more chances my family was like adopting you know adopting this new way of living and eating and yeah you know we made mistakes so. and and so now when you go to a restaurant what's the pitch what's the what are you asking uh can you can you tell me like if I'm the restaurant and you're calling me what are you asking for if you if you want to share if you want to yeah share. no problem so first i always scope out the restaurant online to do like a vibe check sure yeah like does this restaurant <laughs> like do i get the feeling like maybe can i ask would... a question if they yeah. have like a really bad website like if it's like if they don't even keep that up to speed are you a little bit concerned about how they keep the kitchen that that's kind of the vibe check okay. like if i can't <laughs> find their menu if i can't find their menu online then i'm like I don't know about this. Like Uh that could go either way. Got it. Um, And I look for things like, does the chef seem super particular about the ingredients that they're using? Because if that's the case, you know, anecdotally, I'll say that usually the chef seems willing or like interested in allergies, but not always. Um, And one thing that I always look for is on their website, does it say anything about like no substitutions allowed because some chefs are really particular about not wanting to alter their dishes because it's their art. Right. So I just don't go to those restaurants. Right. Like that's the biggest thing that I'm looking for is do they seem like very customer service oriented? That's the vibe that I'm seeking. And then from there, I'll also look at their menu and like, does it have a ton of peanuts on it? Does it have a lot of nuts on it? Like, 
is this a cheese restaurant? If so, I'm not going to eat there, right? Like with a dairy allergy, that mm-hmm. would be unreasonable. So I just try to gauge, um, does it seem like they have kind of, I don't know, not not a ton of my allergens on the menu, which is hard to determine just from looking at a menu, but that's kind of my first checkpoint. Right. Um, and then I'll call them and I'll ask if they can accommodate allergies. And if they like seem to understand what anaphylaxis is or if they even use the word anaphylaxis, that's usually a good sign. Whereas um, if they just kind of say yes or no without really thinking about it, yeah. like if someone says yes too quickly, yeah, then yeah. I'm also <laughs> suspicious. I'm like, you don't really know what I'm asking. <laughs> yeah. When you when you ask like, because um, I've had a lot of experience obviously with restaurants talking to them and mm-hmm. asking them. So if I'm like, hey, do you have a dedicated deep fryer for people with uh, celiac? And mm-hmm. uh, they're like, oh yeah. And then I'm like, no, nah, I don't think so. You would have added a bit yeah. more to that sentence. <laughs> exactly. So those are those little like soft cues that you're looking for to kind of gauge your comfort level. Got it. And so how many allergens are you are you asking are you asking them about? Um, usually on the phone, I'll just say like multiple allergens. Got and it. if they ask, then I'll go into more detail. Um, but the one that I usually bring up the most is dairy, just because it's like such a common thing in restaurants. Right. And then when I go to the restaurant, I always like I make sure there's like a note on my reservation so that they know I'm coming and like hopefully are prepared. Right. And then I always bring my chef card, which like I cannot eat in a restaurant without my chef card because it helps people take me more seriously. Yeah. Um, one of the common things that happens to me if I don't use my chef card is that people just assume that I'm vegan or assume that I have like right. a diet by choice, right. um, you know, because of my age and where I live and stuff. It's just like a, an assumption people make. Right. And so when I present them this chef card and it says on it, like anaphylactic allergies, carries EpiPen, then suddenly I'm taken much more seriously. So I always yeah. bring those with me. That's a great tip to definitely, because there, there are people who like person like myself, for example, I'm the guy who's always asking for, you know, can you, give me that sandwich without the cheese. Can you take the cheese out? Mm-hmm. And then they're like, you know, they give me a look and I'm like, it's not an allergy. It's just, a. Pr- it's, uh, I mean, it, it's an intolerance, but I just say it's a preference. Just take it out. Cause if there's a little bit, it's not a huge deal for me. Uh, but mm-hmm. I know for other people, it's very, very important if you have the allergy. So having that card, I think is, is another, you, you sort of want to keep mitigating the risks, right? So if you can add yeah. that as another layer of mitigation, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a great strategy. Yeah. And especially when you get to a restaurant, it's like busy and noisy. And like sometimes the server just doesn't hear you. Yeah. I've been a server, so I know that that's super common. Right. Um, and this way, if they have a card, you know, they can just take it back to the kitchen and show the chef. And then I don't have to worry that they actually wrote everything down. Right. And I, I think that it's it's really interesting because I wonder how that's going to evolve um, in, in the future. Like it's, it's sort of the card has been around for quite a while uh, yeah. and it, it's got the job done. Uh, eventually though, I imagine, you know, cause right now it's an aside. The thing that, the thing that irks me, Amanda is mm-hmm. restaurants that have, uh, that they annotate their menus with basically two symbols. They have a GF icon and they have a little V or VG. And apparently yeah. that's like the cure all for every dietary restriction. It's like, Oh no, well we have this. And then, and then if it's not that, then you have to go to the very bottom of the menu and you get a little sentence. And the sentence basically tells you, we don't have any answers for you, but you can talk to us and let us know. Which is like, okay, well, I knew that to begin with. <laughs> I actually found that really common. It seems very common in the US. Yeah. Um, we don't have that as much, in, I notice in Toronto, but in the US, it seems like every single menu has that sentence on the bottom. Yeah. And it's, it's obvious because the U S there, you know, everyone's very, uh, lawsuit happy over there. So I imagine there's yeah. some insurance reason why they have that. However, uh, it, it, in addition to that, even in the conversations that we'd have with, with servers, for example, a lot of times the, does anyone here have dietary restrictions or do you have any dietary restrictions or anything? It just feels like they want to speed through that question as quickly as humanly possible, not mm-hmm. even give you a chance to reply really. Like it's not a very, um, you know, it, it doesn't feel like they're asking it because they necessarily want an answer. They sort of just asking it because they want to move past it as, as fast as they can. Do you feel that it's kind of like yeah. just an afterthought? 
I feel that sometimes it's an afterthought. And sometimes when I raise the flag, like, hey, I actually do have dietary restrictions, then they'll come back and be like, we just want you to know that we can't guarantee anything. And then yeah. I'm like, okay, it just like, it gets awkward. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I'd love, I'd love more transparency. And of course we're working towards that. So, um, tell me about the, let's go back into the article now, because I think, I think now's a good time that we have mm -hmm. had a nice warm up here. Um, and we can go into that. So as far as it being discriminatory to ban patrons with, with food allergies, um, the article was written about a month ago. Ha has your opinion changed? And do you want to sort of discuss the, you know, what you wrote in the article there? Clearly you do it a bit better than I would. Um, and then it's just the thesis there. And then maybe how you feel about it now, has anything changed based on the response that, that you've received? Yeah. So I guess, should we first address like the inciting incident that yes, happened? The yes, Instagram post That's that right. sort of lit this all. I'm getting fire. ahead of myself. <laughs> So basically, there was an Instagram post that someone shared about a restaurant in the UK that had a sign in the window that said, if you have food allergies, something along the lines of, do not come in this restaurant. You're not allowed in this restaurant. And that pissed a lot of people off. That was the major yeah. inciting incident recently. Um, and so I, I felt very motivated to write this article because I have been in situations before where I've been asked to leave a restaurant or told that like I'm not allowed to be there um even when I've been like with a group of people and you know if someone says they can't accommodate me I'm fine to not eat but I've even been like, like escorted out of restaurants and then end up standing in the parking lot Sorry, like I don't you've know what been to do now. you've been escorted out of restaurants yes it hasn't happened in a while um but it has happened or I've been asked to leave nicely which um they wouldn't even say it like, he, why, the best. They, they don't even tell you like, Hey, here's have a drink or have something. They just tell you to leave. There have been times when they've said like, we're really not comfortable cooking for you, but like, here's a drink on the house. Mm. I don't have a problem with that, but there have been times in the past where a manager has come over and said like, Oh, can I speak with you? And then we would actually like you to leave because we can't accommodate you here. It's not, you know, and it's, it's very awkward or like they'll open the door. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's very uncomfortable. That's super um, it's weird. a rarity, but it has happened. Yeah, I've and never heard of that. I would have just thought that they would say, hey, we don't have anything for you and you can just chill here with your friends. <laughs> I think some people assume that maybe people are, I don't know, going to sue them. Like, I, just, uh, I don't I really don't know. I don't know right. what the motivation behind those Got it. times is. But um, so, yeah. So in the article, I was basically taking the stance that um, if a restaurant so like I said earlier, I like to know all the information and then make an educated decision. So if a restaurant staff says to me, um, we really cannot accommodate your food allergy because of any reason, maybe the kitchen is too small, they have too many of my allergens around, lack of education, language barrier, et cetera, that's fine. I don't have to eat at that restaurant. I would still like to be allowed to stay if I want to, because maybe I'm with a group of people who are enjoying that restaurant and I'm comfortable to be there right. like for the social aspect. Um, what I think, and also I would say I would rather the restaurant tell me that they can't accommodate me as opposed to pretending that they can accommodating me and potentially put me in a dangerous situation because that's more uncomfortable. Um, what I think is discriminatory is the being asked to leave or being told that you cannot enter because mm. that's a whole different thing. Like it's what it's moves from I'm taking a calculated risk or I'm being informed that I can't eat here and choosing to stay from then the agency is taken away from me because of a medical condition. So I think that's where it's two separate things. I mean, yeah, we, we would never have a sign. It would never be acceptable to say people with, um, you know, mobility issues, for example, are not allowed to, and, and have a sign. It might mm -hmm. be, hey, you know there's there's different ways to approach the subject than how because yeah. the sign is i mean we are past the age of banning people uh, of a specific demographic with signs in the window it's not the yeah. wild west anymore um, exactly. <laughs> um okay so so that's what happened and there was mm -hmm. huge outrage and so uh, you, you you decided you know i'm gonna because this is the natasha found natasha's foundation yeah. right yeah. 
and obviously there's a tragic story there and uh, you know the inception of the foundation and, and the creation of it um, and people can you know look into that and obviously support that foundation we'll have all the links to everything um, but you decided okay this is you know enough of the outrage let's add you know element of common sense into here um, and how did that play out for you how did that how did that go um i would say for the most part people tended to agree with what i said um i think some people had not looked at it from that perspective there are there are people who think that all restaurants should have to accommodate and my hesitancy there is that there could be reasonable reasonable reasons why they yeah. might not be able to accommodate and i'm yeah. fine with that i would just rather know i think my my greatest indicator of allergy friendliness is transparency right. and that goes for food companies and restaurants alike um there were also people who disagreed with me um i don't know for various reasons but i would say for the most part it seemed like people were happy to read something that kind of looked at both sides and a realistic view of the future so the answer pretty much was it depends but yeah. it's never okay to have a sign like that or anything exactly yeah and yeah. like as i said in the article eating in a restaurant with food allergy is a calculated risk a lot of things in life with food allergies are a calculated risk um <clears throat> and not just not just restaurants like i had an anaphylactic reaction when i was a kid because my parents took me to a farm we used to go to a lot of farms and we're in a farm and the farmer was demonstrating how to milk a cow, which even though I have a wow. dairy allergy, I found very interesting. And he jokingly sprayed the kids with milk and I had an anaphylactic reaction. Oh my God. We didn't then blame the farmer or sue the farmer. We mm. just understood that that was a calculated risk in letting me watch that demonstration mm. and something really unfortunate happened. But that doesn't mean that we then blamed the farmer or would have wanted him to say I wasn't allowed to watch. That was a choice that we made. So, well, that's a very mature way of going about it. Um, that's almost, you know, I would say that's an evolved way of going about it because a lot of, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people are quick to just, you know, they're, they're trigger happy when it comes to pointing the blame at others. Uh, and yeah. it's it, it, the easiest way that I find in life is to, to the, the easiest operating system to run on is uh is to take ownership of the things that happen to you because that way you're always in control it's like well yeah. i i could control that and and have a different outcome um it's not exactly. always possible and sometimes so i want to ask you a question because uh in light of that has there have there ever uh, have there has there my grammar is off who, who knows <laughs> um has there ever been a situation where um you you did feel confident you did have the transparency you did say no dairy or there's it's a vegan dairy or whatever or vegan cheese or whatever to replace that. Has there ever, ever been a situation where you still had an issue after that? Yeah, there has. Um, the only example that's coming to mind was actually um, when my that was my brother. My, my mom and my brother also have food allergies. So okay. um, we're quite a bunch to cater to. But, yeah. <laughs> um, the first example that comes to my mind was we were out to dinner. And he had communicated about the allergies with the restaurant we had been to before. He ordered something that didn't have nuts in it. And then after he already started eating it, the server came out and said, stop eating that. We accidentally made it in a pan that just had mm. nuts in it. And that was kind of a terrifying moment. Right. Um, so things like that do happen. And I've had lots of situations like that myself. And those are the things that can make it really nerve wracking because you can tick all the boxes and do everything right on your end and something can still go wrong. Right. So, so e even, even then double check, triple check, um, continuously confirm, which is annoying, but yeah, you know, we, 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 we have to find a way to live. And, and if, if that's what we have to sacrifice to ask a few more questions to be sure, then that's probably, that's probably okay. And, and justified because yeah. things could always be worse, but um, I guess like in your words, why is it worth to you taking these risks? Like why, why not be in the super safe camp? Um, partially because I've been in the super safe camp and it's a little bit lonely and, uh, mm. not, not that much fun. I actually found it in some ways more stressful because, you know, the more you allow a fear to build up, it goes from a hill to a mountain, much easier to climb a hill. Uh -huh. um, 
I think that like eating in restaurants or being out with people, like that's part of our social fabric of being a human and to completely cut that out of your life is kind of a big thing. Like really um, it's especially like I find where I live, it's such a part of our culture to just always be going out and socializing with people in that way. And I would rather take more of a modified approach where maybe I'll go to a restaurant and just order a drink and not eat something. I would rather do that than not go out for the social life at all. You know what I'm saying? So I think hundred percent. And also I'm just obsessed with food and I love food. (laughs) And I, even if the things I'm allergic to, I still like to know about them. I'm still curious. And I feel like I was, okay. I was born with a, a disease, but that doesn't mean that I can't still be interested you know, in the thing that's potentially dangerous for me. So I still like to be present in that world. I don't want to miss out on that scene. Right. Um, I would rather just find a way to do it. Sure. It's a very abstract way of answering that question. No, it's an, it's an excellent way. It's, I I think you articulated it perfectly as far as, you know, the feelings and emotions that go into it. Um, but for people who do have, and you referenced this on, on, um, on your website, uh, the PTSD of having different reactions, different bad situations, negative situations. Um, it seems that you've come to terms with that. And maybe you can describe a little bit how exactly you came to terms with that. But how can other people uh, also come to terms with that if they are in the super safe camp right now and they're hearing you preach and they're hearing you talk and they're like, oh, that sounds amazing. I wish I had the fortitude of Amanda. Um, how could they, how how could they go from point A to point B and and how did you? Um, I think that first of all, understanding that what I was going through was like processing some trauma as I've had, as I mentioned, I've had to use my EpiPen multiple times. And although an EpiPen is a very effective tool, um, still anaphylaxis is a life-threatening situation and you're acting very quickly to save your life. So it's, extremely stressful and after a reaction it's not like you just use your epipen and voila it's over it's very stressful on your body especially i found as i got older it's like a week of getting back to normal it it's it physically and then mentally it takes longer right and i found that i really tended to blame myself um because i always say it's the annoying thing that i always i always say there's no loopholes when it comes to your medical health. Um, If you have an anaphylactic reaction, you're having it. I mean, this this is what it is. You can't get around it. And I really blamed myself and I blamed myself for the chances that I took and um, thinking that they're, you know, the YOLO mentality of like, why don't I try this and see what happens? Um, And I felt like a lot of shame for that. And I felt like I didn't trust myself as much because I had put myself in dangerous situations. Um, so it was really like coming to understand that I was blaming myself for something and not respecting that, yes, I put myself in this dangerous situation. I also like figured, you know, I also used my EpiPen and got myself to the hospital and took care of it too. And yeah. so I had to learn to also respect that I was able to get out of it. Um, even though it was extremely difficult and stressful and scary at the time. And there are like moments of flashbacks to that day or those many days that it happened. So I think something that, um, that I did that really helped me was to, to like bolster my own confidence and to feel like I'm conquering things. I'm a really big fan of personal challenges and um, creative challenges and just doing things that make me feel really empowered and good about myself. And yeah, just... Can you share? I all, Sorry? <laughs> Can you share one of your la- latest and greatest personal challenges? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it could be, it, it's little things and big things. Uh, something little like, I don't know, my friend challenged me to do like a cold water dip ah. um, in Lake Ontario. Uh-huh. And I thought, yeah, that's a good thing. I'm going to do it. And so it's just saying yes to things yeah. is also yeah. saying yes to things that I think will be beneficial. So I'll do little things like that. It right. could be artistic projects. Like I'm going to pitch 
I don't know, a book, or I'm going to paint a mural, even though wow. I have no experience in visual art. Like those are <laughs> certain things like that. I, I find very empowering nice. and um, it moves you forward. And it's important to just not let those feelings of fear just like build up. And as I said, become a mountain. It just makes it harder in the end. So you're, you're continuously challenging yourself. So when it comes time to, you know, David Goggins, the, uh, I don't know if you, if you heard about him, David Goggins no. is a, a former Navy SEAL, ultra marathon runner, really cool dude, wrote a book called Can't Hurt Me. And he has a concept called callousing the mind. So uh, if you keep... It sounds like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you continuously yeah. like, you know, challenge yourself and put yourself in uncomfortable situations and you can become yeah. comfortable being uncomfortable that's when when things really hit the fan then you will know that you know you you have the ability to get out of it um exactly and when i a few years ago when i was really in the thick of my like stress and anxiety about my allergies i used to do this thing where i would go for a walk in the rain and i would let myself get completely soaked and i would just tell myself i'm so uncomfortable right now <laughs> nothing bad is going to happen. It's okay. And it's just such, it sounds kind of silly to say it out loud, but it really helped. Um, it's great how much so uh, I would do things like that. It's, it's really cool to see how much uh, mindset is involved with yeah. just something as simple for the average person as going out to eat. We have to cultivate, you know, especially yeah. people, you know, if you have allergies, if you have any sort of uh, uh, compromise in your, in your diet for whatever reason, medical or, or so on, that uh, mindset is a huge, it's a huge, huge factor. Not to mention, sometimes there's a, a a factor of social embarrassment too. I don't know if you've ever, have you ever felt the social side of it? I'm sure you have. I have for sure. I would say yeah. more so when I was younger. I right. notice now as an adult, sometimes it makes people uncomfortable for me to not be eating. And culturally, that can be a bit of a roadblock to mm. certain cultures. It's rude to not join people when everyone's eating right um in my husband's culture it's like very rude and sometimes i have to be that person and uh -huh. i feel really awkward about it but at the same time i'm like i'm sorry it's probably more rude to go into an anaphylactic shock <laughs> yeah exactly yeah <laughs> then i'd have to leave without yeah. saying anything so. <laughs> choosing one uh one poison over the other <laughs> exactly that's yeah. funny so i find like the the challenge has changed a bit as I got older. When I was a teenager, I was just so embarrassed about it. I just hid my allergies all the time. I didn't want anyone to know about it. Right. And, and do you think there's some element, uh, and I mentioned this, I think we may have been off air um, or not recording, and, and uh, sort of saying that this is perhaps uh, a new social issue that has, mm -hmm. you know, that is sort of arising now because I hear stories all the time, you know, uh, I'm one that I, I tell, I've told on the last like couple episodes, but I think it's, I, I really enjoy sharing it because it's very clear about the sentiment that does exist and the discrimination that does exist. And so I had a restaurant that I emailed in Seattle and I said, Hey, you can sign up for honeycomb. It's free. Um, and we help people with dietary needs, find food they can eat at restaurants. And they replied saying, we put allergens in our food on purpose. What? Yeah, it, it was the most outrageous response that you could possibly come up with. Like you could easily just say no thanks. Yeah. Go away. <laughs> but that's like, you know, that, that was really just mean, frankly, mm -hmm. because it might be like you don't know when your family member is going to get diagnosed with something. You don't know when your best friend is going to come and say, I have this thing to deal with or that thing to deal with. Like people have 38 percent of North Americans are following some sort of diet for some reason. Like whether it's diabetes, yeah. it could be heart disease, it could, they're trying to lower their blood pressure, they're trying to lose weight, they're trying to get into remission. Uh, there's all sorts of things that don't fit necessarily like, you know, that you're a vegan or you have a peanut allergy or whatever. Like people of all, of all sorts are struggling constantly with, uh, with the dietary restrictions that they have. And to have something like that is so crazy. Have you, have you ever heard something that mean before? <laughs> I mean, I, I will make an assumption that that person has a very negative worldview. That's yeah. what I can draw from that. Yeah. Um, I haven't, geez, no, I haven't had anyone say that to me. But I think the biggest change that I've noticed because, you know, I'm 30. So I've been, I've seen many decades of change in this space. And when I was younger, this was like 
food allergies was an exception to manage. Right. So often restaurants felt they were rarely confronted with someone with food allergies. And when they were, um, it was like, if they're a customer service oriented, they want to help this person. And this is just an exception. This is not a normal part of their routine. As I've gotten older, and especially within, I would say the last five to eight years, it's become so much more common. And now restaurants kind of like, some of them have their back up against the wall because they don't know what to do about it. Yeah. Um, some are afraid and some have procedures in place because now it's so common that you kind of need to have a procedure to deal with it. So right. it's really different how people think about it now. Um, and before even food allergies, you can read about this in, in um, books written by doctors within the field. Food allergy wasn't even taken seriously as a medical uh, condition. Doctors didn't even want to research it. There's actually was no significant food allergy research done um, up until like maybe a, a decade ago at most. So it wow. really wasn't taken that seriously. And now people are starting to see that actually, surprise, food plays a huge part in our social <laughs> lives. And therefore, it's not crazy that this would be a social issue. Right. And that... there are also, sorry to interrupt, there are also yeah. assumptions that people make. And I really hope that these stereotypes go away because they're very untrue. But people assume that food allergy is a disease for the wealthy, that, you know, certain people are not, I don't know. Mm. It, there's a lot of stereotypes that go along right. with it. Like and people who don't have any food don't have any food allergies. They just take, eat exactly. whatever they can get. Yeah. yeah. And something I hear a lot is like, well, do you think people in this country have allergies? No, they're tougher than that. And it's like, <laughs> mm, I don't know. <laughs> It's a yeah, disease. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no, I think didn't ask for this. it's, uh, you know, could, potentially the aller allergies themselves, you know, who knows where their origins are, the, 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 you know, what, what genes trigger it or whatever, what foods trigger the genes. I don't know exactly how it works, but there are some geographical trends, but it has nothing to do with being tougher. It's frankly just being lucky. Exactly. It's just being lucky. That's it. If you don't it's being it. And it's also <laughs> like, uh, and uh, something people don't know is EpiPens or epinephrine isn't available everywhere in the world. Mm. Like in North America and Europe and various other places, it's very readily available, but that's not the case everywhere in the world. So, you know, there are things to think about. Right. And um, as far as the, you know, communication skills, I mean, you, you talked about get, having the card ready. We talked about talking multiple times and, and double checking multiple times. Uh, are there any other tips that you want to add to that um, before the fact, after the fact, um, once you get to the restaurant? You mentioned like um, even in your reservation note, you'll put something in. Do you order delivery and put the same note or is that too much of a risk? I don't really order delivery anymore. I used to order delivery. Um, I don't know. Then I had a few bad experiences and I just kind of stopped doing it. Right. But um Usually when, so once I've got to the restaurant, I've spoke to the server, generally like a manager will come out or the chef will come out and want to speak to me. Um, and then we'll go through the whole rigmarole. I like to keep things really simple. And so I always ask them like, please don't give me something that looks like cheese and tell me that it's not cheese because I'm not going to feel comfortable eating it. You know what I mean? Or like, yeah. don't give me pesto and tell me that there's no nuts in it. Cause that's going to be super uncomfortable. So I just like to keep things really simple. And then when the food actually arrives, um, I'll ask them again, make sure this is the allergy meal. And then I'll kind of like dissect it on my plate a little bit yeah, <laughs> just yeah. to like look at it and like, you know, lift up whatever it is. Like, are there anything hiding under there? Right. Um, just like do a little visual check. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's a good call. That's a good call. Um, yeah. How do you feel about the phrase exclusion is not a solution coined by Gail I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Rigione, founder of Allergy Rigione. First. Rigione. Yeah. Oh, I know Gail. You know Gail. Okay, cool. How do you feel about yeah. that? Exclusion is not a solution. Yeah, I think that's true. I think um, I mean, my solution to everything, to education is just so powerful. Mm -hmm. The more you know, the more you can do. And I think that um, people might think exclusion is like an easy solution, but it's not really in the long run because allergies are not going away and more and more people are being diagnosed. And so if you're a restaurant, um, I think it's, it's better to educate yourself and figure out how you can be part of this as opposed to just like backing off altogether. And if the answer is that you learn about it 
and you determine that you can't accommodate, that's fine too. But again, not banning people from your restaurant or asking them to leave, but rather being transparent with them and saying like, we're not, we're not able. Transparency seems to be the running, uh, the running yeah. artery here of, of truth. Yeah, I would say so. Um, so this is the Across the Dietary Universe podcast. And, and one question I'd like to ask all of our guests, uh, because we like to discuss the future here, the future of food, because that's what we're building. And mm -hmm. how do you see, you know, the next few years or even further out into the future play out um, for people with food allergies? Is it always going to be sort of the same kind of vibe or are we, you know, moving into a renaissance potentially of ingredient disclosure and easier time going out to eat and, and potentially even ordering food online. <laughs> hmm, oh, <laughs> thinking big. I would say, okay, there are two sort of factors in the world that are coming together at the same time. One of them is that on mass, people in general, whether they have allergies or restrictions or not, um, are looking for more pure ingredients and are looking to know where their food comes from and what's going into it. So that's kind of one food trend that's happening. Another thing that's happening is that people are allergic to all kinds of things. I mean, unlike celiac disease, allergies can be like, I think there's like 170 known food allergens or something crazy like that. Yeah. So we had the top eight, the top nine, the top 14. It's going to get to a point where you can't have the top 50, you can't, you know, it's, I think yeah. what's going to happen is that companies are just going to become so much more like, transparent about what is in their food, where it's processed, and I'm actually able to give customers that information. Um, I have some allergies that are outside of the top 14. And my biggest challenge is actually getting information about that, because companies will say, sorry, we don't have to have that information. So we're not going to share it with you. Um, we don't know. And that's always difficult for me because I cannot then educate myself. I can't make a good decision because I don't have all the facts. Right. And when you have food allergies, all you want is a clear answer about something, which is the hardest thing to get. Yeah. So um, I think that those two trends will eventually align and companies and restaurants will just be much more transparent about what's going into their food. I love that. And I, I think that helps everyone, which is great. Mm -hmm. It's not just a solution. It's a solution that, that, uh, that is, that can amplify across any other, uh, dietary need or tr even trend. Like if you want, let's say you find out that we find out this particular ingredient is an issue for, it makes you gain weight or something like that. And well, great. When you have ingredient disclosure, when you have that transparency, I think so many, uh, people will benefit from it in so many different ways. So, uh, that's a really unique insight and um, and hopefully prophecy. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully. Fingers crossed. <laughs> um, Amanda, where can people go to... I, I have your website here. It's everydayallergenfree.com. Um, mm -hmm. But what is the thing that they should check out specifically on your site? So you can check out my recent cookbook called Everyone's Welcome. Um, it's available pretty much everywhere books are sold and on Amazon. Um, you can also check out my Instagram, Everyday Allergen Free. And in addition to writing about food allergies, I am actually a food photographer. So oh. you can visit my website, Amanda Orlando Food Photography. Yeah. Oh, wicked. That's really cool. We're always yeah, looking for you. people to collab with. So that might be something uh, for a Toronto uh, restaurants. Um, yeah. Cool. Every, I love that photo of you jumping up with, uh, with the book. <laughs> <laughs> Reflects my excitement about it finally being real. That's awesome. So people can find that at like, uh, wow, like Barnes and Noble and, and what about like, and Indigo as well. Yeah. Yep. Good for you. That's amazing. You. That's amazing. That's definitely something that I think people will see and be like, okay, I will grab that off the shelf. It's very bright and colorful. Awesome. Thank well, you. Amanda, it, it was a pleasure uh, speaking with you today about this topic, which is a sensitive topic for a lot of people. Um, I'm really happy in the way that uh, we approached it. And there's so many cool insights here that I think people are going to love. So, um, yeah, without further ado, I guess I guess we'll wrap up. But thanks so much, Amanda. Thank you. This is great.